thanks everyone for coming along. I was rereading re the coroner's report about this matter last night and he said uh, to the witnesses who were coming forward, you must be very clear to only tell me what the facts are that you know. I don't want you to infer from those facts certain suppositions or theories. Now, I have to confess to having given this talk about 180 times, a limited version, and I will say I have transgressed across that line uh, on some occasions. I happen to know that Professor Abbott is here today, and while I'm sure he won't want to interject too volubly, uh, don't be scared to call me to task if I say something terribly outlandish, uh, Derek, about the inferences that might be made given the facts that we do have available. So the first day of summer in 1948 was very much like any other day in summer. They didn't have daylight savings there. They had people who used to go to the beach and people who didn't go to the beach. There were people who were um, in their bathers and people who weren't in their bathers. Um, it was a Wednesday. And I think the estimated maximum was going to be in the, I don't know, high 70s, low 80s in the old measurement. And um, as people went along um, the beach very early, there were some jockeys exercising their horses in the shallows at Summerton Beach, and they noticed a chap who was quite well dressed, not in his bathers, didn't have his budgie smugglers and a towel around him, he was dressed a bit like me, the, 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 the um, uh, coat, trousers, shoes, um, and he'd been lying out on the sand um, <coughs> in front of this building against this sea wall. His head was up against the wall. And this gentleman didn't move, appeared to be dead, and then another chap who had been walking the previous evening, we're not sure whether he was walking along the esplanade there, or whether, can you see how the steps are truncated at that point, whether there was also a walkway there, but he and his girlfriend think, well they know they saw a person whose legs were sticking out this way, they didn't actually see his face. So the next day, they thought, well, it looks like it's the same bloke, but they couldn't absolutely swear to the fact. That's what the coroner was saying when they were called to give evidence. Don't tell us it was the same man if you didn't see his face. Tell us you saw a leg sticking out or on a slight angle in the same position 12 hours earlier. So they called Constable Moss from the Brighton Police Station. He came and had a quick look around. Couldn't see any reason why a person would be dead. Like, it wasn't as though he had a, a tomahawk between his, his shoulder blades. But he was very evidently dead, and the, in those days there was no St John ambulance service. The police offered the ambulance service, so he rang into the police. They brought their ambulance down. Now this was, this was the old crippled children's home. It had been owned by the Bigford family, Bigford and his brown line Cordial family. And the, Bigford, uh, the, the police ambulance came along. They took the man uh, between half past six and about eight o'clock into the Royal Adelaide Hospital, where a Dr Bennett looked at him, he didn't take him inside the hospital, he looked at him in the back of the ambulance and said, well, he looks to me as though he's been dead six to eight hours. So they found him at half past six, about quarter to nine by the time they get into the hospital, go back six to eight hours, death occurred in the view of Dr. Bennett a little after midnight. Okay? You need to, you need to find a little pace in your brain to put some of this information because it all comes back and you start asking yourself questions about now is that exactly right or did he say something else about that because you might have another idea of it yourself. So there, that's a recreation of people there. So in those cases where a person is found in a public place and they are um, they're dead suddenly and their own GP won't write a death certificate, you're taken into the custody of the coroner. Now the coroner, very old English jurisdiction um, uh, office, and the coroner's mortuary in those days was in the grounds of the West Terrace Cemetery. Uh, if you had you know, enough energy this afternoon and Darren was prepared to take you down to West Terrace, that's all you'd see, that bit of polished green grassy stuff, that's all you'd see of the coroner's mortuary building. And in that building, uh, sorry, and opposite, opposite those gates, there's the Elephant and Castle Hotel. Now that's a, a big part of the story and it is still there today. Um, and it comes back later. So, um, at the coroner's mortuary, this man, Dr. John Matthew DeWire, um, did what they call an autopsy. Now, he was not a pathologist, really. Now, John DeWire was 
a GP in general practice on the Port Road at Brompton, uh, but he had a fascination with, with, with autopsies, and he had done a lot of them. By the time he retired, he had done 10,000 autopsies, and the current generation of, uh, you know, properly trained pathologists here uh, knew him and had uh, worked with him up to a point, and they regarded his ability to find cause of death very highly. But some of the other skills that a modern pathologist might bring to the examination of uh, a cadaver, uh, they thought perhaps they had some reservations about. So what did he find? He found a chap who's 45, taller than me, tan, although they said the sun tan appeared to relate to the previous summer's sun. Um, not, perhaps not a big point, but something to think about. Fit, strong heart, perfect physique, well dressed, clean shaven, you can see all these things. An intellectual look, no scars or vaccination marks, wedged toes, elevated calf muscles, and a European look. Now, going backwards, the European look, when you read other literature about this, has been disputed. Some people say it looked like a Britisher. Uh, but they were talking this European look, they were talking about. Uh, the uh, Northern and Eastern European immigrants who had come into Australia in the post-war years. The, uh, I've been walking back and forth a bit here, I've got two legs, I presume I've got two sets of calf muscles and they're perfectly, I don't, I don't even know they're there. But the instant I bounce up on my toes, I can feel them tense, they rise up in the back of your, your leg. Um, Dwyer commented on the fact that this man appeared to have elevated calf muscles. And the wedged toes referred to the fact that he appeared, his toes appeared to have been forced forward into tight-fitting shoes um, habitually to the fact that they were wedged, in fact. Um, uh, perhaps we come back to that. Now, the condition of the body, this is the internal uh, observation, in DeWine's opinion, appeared to indicate that the man had been poisoned. All right? So there was no... Um, traumatic sign of death, like a gunshot wound or a, you know, an axe or a baseball bat, that sort of wound. There was nothing outside, nothing mechanical outside. Inside, both his coronary arteries and his head arteries um, were, were, were quite clean. He was a heavy smoker, but uh, the arteries had not forced a stroke or a heart attack. Um, and so the only other way you die is really if there's some biochemical interference with the insides, something that forces you to stop breathing or, or, or forces your heart to seize up. Um, the, the, some of the major organs are engorged with blood. He found the evidence of uh, his last meal in the stomach and there was potato in that and other ingredients which seemed to indicate that he had had a pasty. Um, perhaps not an unusual thing to have in summer on a beach or in an Australian beach. Um, in the inside of his pockets, there were Army Club cigarette box with Kensita cigarettes in it, a, a, a train ticket to Henley Beach, which had not been checked, a bus ticket to St. Leonard's, come back to that, and a ticket which had been, juicy fruit, chewing gum, some matches, and some combs. What wasn't there, of course, was um, a wallet or anything that might identify the man, a passport. Uh, any papers at all that might give him any information as to his uh, name or his uh, address. Um, he, he didn't have a hat, didn't have an overcoat. Overcoat's not so um, so unusual at the beginning of summer, I suppose. So uh, one of the interesting things, though, about his clothing appeared to be that all the all of the clothes had the tags that you normally associate with a fine suit like this made for Target South Australia. All those, all those labels had been neatly cut off. It wasn't as though the man had been somehow found on the beach and someone had come up to him and got his clothes and ripped the labels out. They had been neatly cut out. Even the tag on the singlet, the underpants, that sort of thing. And this created the impression that either the man himself or someone was taking steps to try and make sure he couldn't be identified. Uh, we've talked about the contents of the clothing. Now this is where my, my family comes into it because the, the edits have been funeral directors since the middle of the 19th century. And they, this little building on the Port Road at Bowden was only a couple of hundred metres closer to the city from where Dr. Dwyer was set up as a medical practitioner. So um, my 
father and two of his brothers were in business as funeral directors in those premises back in the late 40s, and they knew Dwight intimately. I mean, they, they, they knew him well. The, the, his own father had been a doctor who had brought into the world 11 babies um, that my grandmother had in that bedroom there. Um, and uh, they, they were always getting death certificates from him and back and forth and, and a lot of talk. So um, you have to remember now, Dwyer, apart from doing his work as a general practitioner, was in the city morgue. The city morgue is located within West Terrace. West Terrace was the site of the only crematorium in Adelaide in those days. Uh, the Centennial Park crematorium, the Enfield crematorium, just simply didn't exist. There were three main cemeteries at West Terrace. There was the big general cemetery that most people know uh, from years ago because it went ran down so much, but um, it, it, it is now much more modern and it's, it's a great place to visit. You know. uh, but um, there was the big AIF, the First World War soldiers were buried there in big numbers, and there was a massive Catholic cemetery on the northern boundary. So most of the burials and certainly all of the cremations in Adelaide were done at West Terrace. All the grave digging was done by hand. Um, all the monumental masons put their stuff there by hand. They had no hydraulic arms on their trucks. Uh, the coroner's people were in and out of the mortuary. The funeral directors were now in. And all of them, on the first day of summer, figured it would be a good idea to have a drink at the Elephant Castle across the road. So uh, that's where the story went around about this man that Dr. Dwyer had found. He couldn't find the cause of death and didn't know his name. And the tans had been taken off his clothing. The, the body was... Um, uh, my uncle, who was one of those funeral directors on the court road there, went to Dwyer and said, well, look, why don't I embalm this chap for you? Uncle Laurie was very keen on embalming. Why don't I embalm this man? And that will mean that you can keep the body for longer, pending the day when you might get some um, uh, an attempted identity. So this is taken a day or two after death. This is taken on the 10th day after death, after initial embalming, and this is six months later. Uh, it appears to me the body looks quite different, the face looks quite different over that period of time. Embalming the fluids uh, have the, the tendency to, to bloat out the tissue. Um, the, the, there's a gentleman here today who acts um, for the, uh, for the uh, advertiser as liaison with the, the police and the newspaper. Um, and of course in those days the police roundsman, uh, this is exactly the sort of case that he got onto and, and put into the um, into the paper and, and people were invited. Do you know this man? Because normally if a person goes missing, someone rings up and says, oh, so-and-so didn't come home to tea last night, so-and-so didn't come to work today, someone didn't come and pay his rent yesterday, we'd like to know where he is. And this is where the good people of Adelaide came to the rescue. They were reliably looked at the photo and said to the police, it's Jack McLean, and he's a seaman, he lives at Prospect. So the coroner's squad, it's not just pathologists in there, they also have police officers, they went out to Prospect, but Jack McLean was still there, as was Ray Clark, as was his sister Kelly. <laughs> and they couldn't, they couldn't help themselves helping the police, and it just wasted the entire police time. Eventually, he was a, you know, a relative, a friend, a, a fisherman, a Bulgarian, and a lady wrote from Melbourne to say she hadn't seen her son since before the war. She thought it was probably him. Could they please let her know? So, got, got them nowhere on the identity. Now, among the possessions of the, the man, and you saw a bus ticket, uh, this man, Ed Hall, that's a later picture, he had the job of scrutinising the stubs from the bus tickets that the conductors took back to the depot uh, together with the takings in their leather bags. Um, if, if, do any of you remember getting on the bus? And, you know, there, there was a, if, on the back of this, uh, there were John Leal, the stationary people, advertised, and there was a little saying on the back. Looking at that information, that's not exactly the ticket, it's a, it's a good facsimile of the style of ticket. Ed Hall was able to say that that bus was sold for the 11.15 service leaving North Terrace Adelaide on Tuesday the 30th of November, so one day before the man was found, um, and it was heading for St Leonard's, so let's call St Leonard's for North North, just the straight at the end of the Anzac Highway, just at the end there. Um, and um, it was... Um, uh, 42 tickets sold for the journey. Now, not everyone got on a stop one because those, that, that denomination ticket was sold along North Terrace and around onto West Terrace. Uh, but it appeared to be, uh, you know, the, the bus was reasonably full and people would have been sitting as close as you are on a bus. And, so, and the police thought you might have remembered a chap dressed like this, tall, you know, sat on the bus next 
you, no one seemed to remember the man being on the bus at all. Um, it was a, these buses, so that's, that's Rumble Street in 1946. You know, there's a lot of activity. That's North Terrace, as you can imagine, is one street over. Um, Christmas came, Christmas went, nothing happened. The, the, the coroner got a bit stitchy. His police officers were not able to turn up any evidence. Dr. Dwight had no idea who the man was or what he died from. So they went to the Adelaide Railway Station. They put it in the hands of the CIB. And the detectives went to the railway station and went to the uh, unclaimed luggage department and said, did somebody come in here on or about the 30th of November last year, deposit luggage, and then uh, fail to come back to claim it? <coughs> um, the, the, the luggage uh, man, the station master, wherever he was, found this suitcase. It, it, it's a quite, this, this photo was taken in 1978. They, they, the police still have the suitcase um, 30 years later. It's now gone missing. But it was quite a new suitcase, quite commonly uh, a common sort of a suitcase. There's the detectives looking very happy with themselves at the Adelaide station having found the suitcase. And in it, they found all sorts of things. You can see a pair of slippers, quite a nice um, uh, dressing gown, various uh, trousers, coats, underwear, only one pair of socks. And, um, uh, the, uh, the, and these items, a sharp pair of scissors, a stenciling brush, tie, some heavy thread, and a knife. Now, if you look at that dressing gown, that was one of the typical items that the man had, where again, the internal label had been cut off. So they don't know that this is the man's luggage, but they gradually put together evidence from the style of clothing and the, um, uh, and the evidence of this man, Mr. Hugh Poser, who was a tailor. They gave him the two sets of clothing, and said, do you, think, well, they, I suppose it's a leading question, do you think this could belong to the same man? But the, the idea was to try and get an opinion, and you said, in particular, because of the weave of the cloth on certain of the items, it was a very unusual weave, not done in either Britain or in Australia, only done in certain parts of North America. And so uh, they were able to conclude pretty comprehensively that the suitcase they had found at the station belonged to the man that they'd found on the beach. Still don't know who he was or what he had died from, and which is all the coroner wants to know. Um, now, this is typical of what my uncle collected at the time. Because he'd been involved in the embalming, he took a quite an interesting case. He slipped out of the newspaper and wrote in purple pencil, 15149. So this involves um, what they found in the suitcase. They found that roll, uh, that a card of barber thread and when they put that thread under the microscope and then compared it with the thread on a button that had been re-sewn on the trousers. Remember the days when men had button-up flies, there are a lot more buttons on your trousers than there are now. One of those buttons had been re-stitched and the thread matched. So this was more than just circumstantial evidence. They were getting pretty close to being um, that they had the right man. So uh, at this stage, they got, um, well, I mean, that's sort of January. It wasn't taking them very far, and the coroner asked this man, Professor Cleland, who I think Derek will mention uh, when he speaks, um, he, what they now describe as a polymath. That word wasn't around when I was younger, but it's, he, he was just an, an, one of these genius sort of types. And they said, look, Professor, why don't you examine all the evidence we've got so far? And in a rather unusually uh, situated fog pocket in the man's trousers, the trousers that were on the beach, not the ones in the suitcase, they found a little scrap of paper which appeared to have been uh, torn out of the book. It wasn't handwritten. It had these two words on it, Taman should, Taman shut. And eventually they worked out through a long, complicated process that these were the last two words of quite a famous poem, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. And, um, and it basically, there's, a, there's the last verse, the moving finger writes, and having ripped, moves on. Nor all thy piety, which I really can, nor all thy tears wash out a word of it. And then the Taman shut appears at the bottom here. And it means there's some uh, discussion about the exact um, tense of the word, whether it's a noun or a past or a verb, but it means the end, or it is ended, or it is over. So there's a dead person unidentified, no cause of death, found on a beach with this hidden in their fog pocket. What conclusions do you draw from that? Suicide? Uh, yes. Um, possibly. 
Um, now this is exactly where the coroner comes in and says, I mean that's exactly right, isn't it? You think, well, suicide. And the coroner says, well, stick to the facts. Don't get carried away with the inferences that you might like to draw from that. The coroner will draw any inferences that are unnecessary. Um, so they took the man's fingerprints, and I've got the thing uh, for, for Professor Abbott today to uh, have a look at those fingerprints again. Um, and they sent it all around the world. Now, of course, through Interpol, Interpol at that stage had no jurisdiction beyond what was called the Iron Curtain. Remember the geopolitics of the time had, you know, someone had said it was like an iron curtain had come down over the east of Europe. But he was, this man came back with clean skin. There was, he'd never been arrested or fingerprinted for any criminal matter in any of the big jurisdictions where he might have um, been. This man comes into the picture then, it's for, um, Mr. Paul Lawson. He, was, he called himself a preparator at the uh, Adelaide, at the South Australian Museum. He's still alive, I think. He must be 98 or something now. And he, um, uh, he was asked by the coroner to prepare a, a plaster cast of the man because ultimately they were going to have to have an inquest. And uh, he did so, and uh, that, that is still down in the, um, in the police historical museum at Theban. Um, the then authorised the burial of the body, and guess who the funeral records were who got the job? There was my uncle Laurie, the man who had embalmed the body, and his younger brother Jack, who was my father. This man is a chap called Claude Trebegan, and he uh, was a funeral director in a smaller way out of Nord, and he just loved funerals, and so when the ethics were busy, he used to come and give him a hand. And that was four, four other people. Um, this gentleman is the Salvation Army officer from Whitmore Square. Now, I don't know if any of you remember the days when the Salvation Army officers used to go around at the pubs, and they'd wrap the tin and sell the war cry, and the idea was, oh, there's a lot of people here drinking in pubs on Friday nights. Um, the, 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 um, they, you'd give them a donation. Well, of course, this man, because he would have frequented the Elephant Castle Hotel, um, he was asked would he leave the funeral services. He knew about the case. Leo Kenny was the licensee of the uh, Elephant Castle, and um, he'd taken quite an interest in the case, and uh, he, uh, he was asked to be a pallbearer. The other two gentlemen, one's the police roundsman, and one is the secretary of the Grandstand Bookmakers Association. Now, the, uh, Kenny had horses, and the Grandstand Bookmakers Association met in one of his back rooms. So they passed around the hat and raised sufficient money to lease a grave at West Terrace so the man would not be buried as a pauper. Um, that was fairly common in those days. But, uh, sorry, being buried as a pauper was fairly common. Anyone of injured means could be buried, but they, there was no concern about it. You just got an unmarked grave somewhere. So the, um, and the police roundsman was the man who had actually alerted them originally to the, uh, the fact that the words came from the tavern from the Uruguay out of Omar Khayyam. Very, um, very plain little funeral, there it is. And um, within, a, within a very short time, a monumental mason from Keswick uh, did up the grave and put on it a headstone that says, here lies the unknown man who was found at Sunderland Beach, 1st of December 1948. There it is. Now this is another clearing. This is the coroner, the state coroner of the day, convened an inquest and uh, sought uh, evidence from a whole number of people, some of them I've mentioned, and others as well. Now the one in particular he, he asked to come in was a Sir Stanton Hicks, um, very, very prominent um, uh, professor at the university who had many, many different strings to his bow and he had examined a lot of the evidence, in particular a lot of the matter relating to poisons. Um, and, and, um, I'll leave it to Derek to talk about Sir Sam Hicks, and we, you know, we can tease a bit more about being out with questions later on. The, the advertiser sort of, um, uh, so, oh, that's, that would dominate the advertiser, Doug, sorry. This was the article that appeared in the Adelaide Truth. Doctors differ. So DeWire said, look, I can't find a cause of it, it must be poison, but the government analyst um, couldn't find any trace of any known poison in the body. Now remember, poisons were a lot more common those days. You could buy all sorts of rat poison and rat filler just at your local hardware store. So accidental poisonings and deliberate poisonings were much more common now. So the old, old chemists were much more adept at finding poison than perhaps some of the modern ones. But they couldn't reach anything, so Mr. Cleland had to adjourn the inquest, seen ADA, and um, it's, I mean, it's effectively, effectively, if you had evidence about the matter of the day, you could go to the police and they'd be right on board to, uh, to find out. Now, that would be the end of the case, except about 
Um, a fortnight later, we're at Glenelg Bridge. There's Jenny Rowe, there's the jetty, and a book is a, 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 a chap goes out of the glove box of his car, we think this is the way it happened, and found in it a book. Now, he took it in his wife, she didn't know anything about it, but she said, well, hang on, the police have been looking for a book with this title. It was the room out of Omar Khayyam. They took the book to the police, and sure enough, the police found that on the back page where the words Taman Shad would normally be printed, uh, it, it had been, uh, it had been uh, torn out. And so they put the scrap of paper they had and the ink under the microscope and it matched up. So they appeared now to have the book, but the book didn't have the man's name and address in the front. Um, a day or two later, one of the police officers found on the back cover of the book this five lines of what lettering, which you know some people call it code. Um, if you pick one of these up as you came in off the desk, it, it's there for you. Um, and a phone number. And of course, you've got to remember the, the mind of the population at the time. It's just after the war. Loads of people, hundreds of people, uh, knew someone who had worked in the army or you know, one of the services during the war as a cryptographer or, or as a you know, code breaker. And there were all sorts of attempts made. Even if they published that in the paper tomorrow, someone would write into the police and say, I've cracked the bars. You know, people are really clever at that. Um, but it gets the police nowhere. Um, the phone number was a bit more interesting. They ran the number and they could tell from the, um, the, uh, the letter prefix that was on the Glenelg exchange and they ran and they said to the lady who asked the phone, do you know anything about the Rubai out of Omar Khayyam? She said, as a matter of fact, I do. I was nursing in Sydney at the end of the war. I gave a copy of the book to uh, a chap called Al Boxall and um, you know, they said, well, that's interesting. And, uh, uh, well, beyond that, uh, I, I won't go into all the detail because we, we sort of look at them at the time. But eventually, the police went to our Boxall, who was still alive in Sydney, and said, um, do you know anything about a woman giving you a copy of a book, The Rubai Out of the Family? He said, oh, yes, certainly. He went inside and he picked up on his bookshelf. <laughs> he, had, he had that copy still. So now there are two copies of the book. But this nurse, her phone number was somehow linked to the book that was found at the mill. At that point, I normally give up. I just can't get my head around exactly what did happen, but we might solve it today. There's a uh, Stuart Littlemore interviewed our Fox on TV about 1978 and described him as being somewhat evasive. Um, the South Australian Truth is at the front page down there in the back. Solved the mystery 10 years later. This is 1959. All turned out to be a hoax. There was a chap in New Zealand in a prison who wanted to get out of prison for a day to talk to the police if they'd give him 25 pounds. <laughs> they, went, they went to New Zealand, but they did give him the 25 pounds. Um, there's the grave today. There's one of those original detectives. And as the story went on, the talk came that, well, you know, maybe there's a spy story in this, perhaps, you know? And each time it's run, that, that lies me. So I think I would just leave the, the bare basic facts there without delving into it and, um, uh, and answer some questions and then uh, see what Derek uh, wants to pick up from, from the other side. Thanks, Tony. So yes, we'll take some questions for Tony. Questions? Wow. Thank you, Pat Yes, go on. Sorry, it's not the final verse. I, I, you're quite right. I played those slides around last night and I missed up. The final verse is, And when thy foot with shining foot shall pass among the guests, are scattered on the grass, and in thy joys there a breach spot where I made one turned out empty glass. I beg your pardon. <laughs> so that other verse, the moving finger rights, is, is probably the more commonly the quoted one. Thank you. Oh, everyone's on their toes today. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Footwear. I mean, these days we leave a distinct Yes, he had, a, he had a, quite a good pair of shoes. He was not a man who uh, couldn't afford to buy a decent pair of shoes. The, the uh, coroner commented on the fact, well, the wire really was the one who commented on the fact, the shoes were very highly polished, unlikely to be the shoes of a man who had been you know, walking around all day and scuffing them and on the beach and that sort of thing. Um, uh, 
But of course, the footprints on the beach are worthless. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, do, you, do you think there's a common of this government and uh, look for any information? They might have different about immigration rather than some of the other migrants. Uh, uh, Detective Jerry Feltus, who in more recent years has written a book about, well, he's studied the case and investigated, he's actually written a book about this, and he outlines in there, the question's asked, you know, did the police do a good enough job? And he says, well, given the resources they had at the time and police methods they had at the time, he believed their uh, methods were extremely thorough. Yes, they went to police jurisdictions, they sent stuff off into state. Uh, whether they specifically went to the Commonwealth Government and asked about immigration records, I don't know. They certainly went to the big maritime companies, they asked were there any sailors who had gone missing. Some of the items that were there, the stenciling items, that someone said they would be the typical items that the third mate on a merchant cargo vessel would use because he would be stenciling on big wooden crates, you know, port of, you know, wherever, San Diego or port of, you know, Southampton and that sort of thing. Um, so I've, I've not read that they checked with the Department of Immigration. Did you read no, but I think they, I think they did. They, they did ask as, as much as they could about that. Yes, sir. One, two, three. Yes. The um, lack of houses on the hand is that um, something that uh, is a, a strong value of um, somebody's past profession? It, it, it's, a, it's an interesting point to pick up because, notwithstanding. This, they said his hands were uh, very well manicured, very well kept. He was not the sort of man who would have been doing, for example, would have been doing work for a third mate on a ship, um, or would have been uh, outside doing hard manual labour. However, he was quite muscular. Uh, his heart muscle was, was firm and tense. It, 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 he wasn't sort of a you know, potato couch, you guess, I don't watch the midday movie all day. Um, it, it, so there's a little bit of, in my mind, some ambiguity about exactly that he had. He seems to have been a strong, powerfully good sort of person. So there was someone here and then back to you. Yes? I was just going to ask, do you know if they asked the nurse and also the person that received the report, whether they knew anything about some of those being written in the report, what stage of those were written, whether they were written? Interestingly, uh, no, I don't know if they asked, did they know anything about letters being written in the book. The book that our Foxall had, which he showed to Stuart Littlemore in 1978, the, the nurse had actually written in uh, ink inside, not the back cover of the book, but inside maybe the third page of the book, plot train number 70 from the book. Which is, um, which is one of the verses. The, the, the whole book is about, the whole poem is in four line stanzas. And she had written this, rewritten this out. And it's sort of in the words seem to be making some sort of an apology about something. It's a bit hard to tell what, what it really means. And of course, this book's not written in English, it's written in Persian. There've been many attempts to translate it. And the copy that most people rely on is a, 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 a Professor Fitzgerald who was an, uh, an Oxford University Don in the 1860s. Uh, and his version um, was his mainly the one. So, but you can get other versions of what the, what the verse is too. So the short answer to your question is, I do not know if they asked them specifically about the code of the back or about the letters. Okay, I may have to stop questions yes, there, yes. because I want to move on to the next speaker. So thank you very much for his presentation. everyone, my name is Derek Abbott um, and I've been asked to talk about the university's involvement in the Somerton case. And as you'll see, it starts right from the very beginning of the case. Uh, first of all, you'll know what the uni looks like, started in 1874 and um, that's the building uh, I work in. Uni's famous for uh, these three Nobel Prize winners at the top, we educated them and there's a couple of other guys there that are equally famous. So, to the case itself, uh, as Tony said, it uh, all starts on December the 1st, 1948, when the guy was found dead, where X marks the spot. This is the locality, this is what it looks like. Um, here's Glenel Jetty, as you all know. The man arrived by bus somewhere out here, off, off the photo, 
and it appears that he walked all the way down uh, to the beach and where he was found dead. Uh, this, this dotted line here shows where Summerton Beach begins. It's on this side of the line and the Mel Beach is this side. And the lady who he had the phone number of, she actually lived here, which is just five minutes walk from where he was found dead. Um, so that's, that's the mystery there. So, where is the involvement of the uni? So it starts in 1948, so first thing is, uh, as Tony showed, uh, an autopsy was done. And it was done by um, John Dwyer, as, as Tony said. And um, Dwyer uh, was nicknamed by the students at Adelaide Uni, Bar. Bob Wyatt, and uh, he actually taught uh, pathology at the uni to some of our students. So here are his autopsy findings. I've shortened it a bit, just the key things, that the spleen of the man was three times bigger than normal and uh, there were parts of his liver that were destroyed. Um, so he, something like that doesn't just happen overnight to have a spleen three times as big as normal. So it's obvious that this guy had some sort of pre-existing illness before he died. The other observation Dwyer made is the guy had a perfectly healthy heart, as Tony mentioned. However, it, it was heart failure that was the final cause of death. So there's a little paradox there. I won't draw any conclusions, I'll leave that to you. Uh, some observational findings. The guy had grey eyes. He had mousy coloured hair with red flecks brain sides. Uh, the guy was uncircumcised. Uh, he had no sand in his mouth, little sand in his hair, fine physique, well looked after. Uh, his back teeth and his lateral incisors were missing. He didn't have a dental plate. And if he was speaking, the missing teeth were not noticeable. So the lateral incisors are here right in front. And so if you didn't see gaps, if he was speaking, that means the gaps were closed up. So quite likely, because it's on both sides, that's quite likely that's a congenital thing rather than he lost his teeth. Uh, so what are exactly the lateral incisors? So they're these guys here, they're between the middle teeth and the canine teeth. And here's somebody you will know who's got one missing, uh, Tom Cruise. But he's only got it on one side. Summerton Man had it symmetrically on both sides. 1949 comes along and the coroner uh, hasn't got any breaks on, on solving this case, so he writes this letter on the 5th of April to Bert Cleland, who's at the, uni works at the university, asking for some help. So this is Bert Cleland. Um, who's basically a professor of pathology at Adelaide Uni. He had performed about uh, 7,000 autopsies in his whole life. At 19, in 1949, when this actually happened, when he was approached, he was what was called an emeritus professor. What that means is you're allowed to keep your office and work, but they don't pay you anymore. So it's kind of semi-retired. In 1964 he got knighted, um, and in the 60s he basically lost his eyesight, but it was starting to get degraded quite badly around this at the time, but it was good enough that he could do the job, and that's what he looked like. Um, as I mentioned, he was knighted later, and this is his official portrait that still hangs in the university today. So, here are some of the key things that uh, Cleland did that he added to the, uh, to the uh, discoveries of the time. It was actually Cleland that did the matching between the suitcase uh, and, and the guy. He actually went through all the contents himself, made sure the clothes fit the dead man, and he made a number of observations about the thread, etc., etc., as Tony mentioned. He noted that the fingernails and the toenails were very well manicured and cared for and that the shoes were extremely shiny, as Tony mentioned. In fact, he reported that the shoes were almost new. So the guy had some money to buy very nice new shoes. They weren't uh, from a manufacturer, they were bespoke, which
which means they're handmade by a cobbler. And uh, Cleland recorded that inside the shoes were stamped the numbers 204B, which is basically the number of the cobbler's last. But that number was never <coughs> been able to trace to a, a cobbler around in Adelaide at least. He also recorded that the man had no hair parting, the hair was just brushed back. He also found uh, the words tamam shud uh, in the rolled up in the man's pocket, as Tony has mentioned already. And this is a photograph of the actual piece of paper that was found on the man's body. And it means uh, finished or ended. Tamam means finished, and should is an auxiliary verb which puts it into the past tense. So, uh, as Tony mentioned, the uh, book was later found. Uh, a guy who had it chucked into his Hillman Mink somewhere on Jetty Road handed it into, handed into the cops six months later. And this is the actual photo of the front cover from the advertiser newspaper at the time. Unfortunately, the police have now lost this book, so we don't have it. But uh, in, at the time, in 1949, they were able to take this book and the piece of paper to an expert in Lee Street in Adelaide, who was an expert in paper, who carefully examined this piece of paper, its weight, uh, texture, uh, quality, all that sort of thing, and he came to the conclusion that it had really come from that book. Which means, of course, that the uh, page that it was torn out from uh, was that the hole was bigger than the piece of paper, so it had been pared back. You couldn't you couldn't match it up from the hole, so you needed to look at the texture carefully. Um, then the so that was Cleland's uh, work, and that was quite a big breakthrough finding that uh, piece of paper because what that did is that led to that book which then had the telephone number of the nurse, which the police rang up. And so that was the police's best lead to identifying the Sumter man at the time. Uh, Cleveland also records in his personal notes that he consulted the professor of anatomy at uh, Adelaide Uni called uh, Andrew Abbey about the dead body. So Andrew Abbey's mind was also uh, on the case, uh, Cleland, I believe, was asking his uh, advice on probably the ethnicity of the man. But nothing much could be said about the ethnicity, and Cleland said in the inquest himself, well, to me, the guy just looks British. He looks like a Britisher. Uh, interestingly, uh, when the cast was made of the dead body, as Tony mentioned, um, Cleland also ordered for a plaster cast to be made of a man's hands and for the man's skull to be removed before burial. But the police didn't like that and they whisked the body away before Cleland had a chance to get that done. And Cleland was furious, uh, he was livid. And my guess is that the motivation for keeping the man's skull is his conversations with Abby because Abby was an anatomist, and I, I, this isn't recorded anywhere, but my guess is that Abby said to him, if you can get this skull so I can have it on my desk, uh, you know, I can do some anatomical measurements of the skull and possibly come up with some extra clues. Uh, <clears throat> but that never happened, unfortunately. Another guy that uh, Cleland consulted, that's written in Cleland's personal notes, is he consulted a lecturer in medicine about medical aspects of the body, uh, John Poynton. Uh, this guy is quite uh, fascinating. Uh, his, uh, I mean, his life would make a whole extra talk. Just to give you a little uh, tickler, uh, when he died, in his will, he left um, 15,000 rare books to Melbourne University Library. Shame he didn't leave it to us. Uh, also, in his will, he left 700 paintings to the National Gallery of Australia. He was pretty well off this guy. There were Picassos, Matisse's, <laughs> and also William Morris's as well. And just, this is just a bit of trivia, just by coincidence, the nurse, 
uh, we've had the phone number, one of her favourites was William Morris, but that's obviously just a coincidence. <laughs> Another guy that um, Cleland uh, consulted was Ted Lipsham, who was the head of pharmacy at Adelaide Uni and asked him about poisons and such like. But the guy that actually came along to the inquest and uh, gave expert witness about the poison was uh, Sir Cedric Stanton Hicks, who was the professor of physiology at Adelaide Uni. And in the inquest, he basically wasn't able to say whether a poison killed the guy or not, but he said that if it was one, his guess is it would be in a group, in a group of poisons of which Digitalis is a member. So that sort of group of poisons. That was his guess. So nothing much happens over the years, but everything goes quiet. And the next thing that happens is around 2003, um, a guy called Ken Brown, who head, heads up, uh, well he's retired now, but he headed up the uh, forensic orthodont uh, orthodontics unit at Adelaide Uni. Uh, in fact, I think he, he was the guy who started it. He studied uh, the teeth of the Somerton man, not from the real body, of course, because it's buried, but from notes that were written about the teeth, uh, to see if he could uh, come up with anything new, and he was unable to. Then the next part of the story is 2015, so, sorry, 2007 to 2015, which is the present day, uh, and this is when I started getting interested in the case and having a look at it. So I'm just going to give you a quick course tour of some of the things we've done in, in my group and that I've done together with some of my colleagues in the uni. So the first thing, uh, we slowed slow going in 2007, but things started really hotting up in 2009. Uh, when I started getting more information on the case. And around 2009, I started my first honours project group. Uh, and we started looking at the code letters of that were on the back of the book. And we started doing statistical analysis of these letters to see... The, well, the actual task I set the students was not to crack the code. I said, don't crack the code. What I want you to do is tell me what it isn't. So uh, they had to go through various World War II types of coding schemes and eliminate them. And to say, okay, it's not this one, it's not this one, what is it? Uh, another thing they did is they got 20 of their friends drunk with beer <laughs> and got them to write random letters on pieces of paper and they statistically analyzed random letters written by drunk people and compared it to this. And it appears that this, the statistical structure, it does show some structure that it is meant to make some sense and they aren't simply just random letters. So we did conclude that. And we eliminated um, over time, not just this group, but other groups in future years, we eliminated 40 different types of ciphers that were known at the time. So, uh, <coughs> Our latest hypothesis from statistical tests is we found that these letters most closely match the first letters of English words, not the body of the words, just the first letters. So this year's group, and I'm happy to see one of the members here, Nick, in the front, so you can talk to him later, um, he is tasked with this. Given that we believe that these are the first letters of words, there's two possibilities. One possibility is that, hey, these are just the first letters of words, and so uh, it's just a mnemonic. So how can we possibly find out what it says? What would be great is if we could just do a Google search uh, and just go, say, S star, A star, M star, S star, etc., and search the whole world by web and find phrases that match those first letters and try and fit together phrases uh, and we could get guess at what the whole thing's trying to say. So, uh, that, but unfortunately, Google doesn't allow you to do that, as you know. It doesn't allow you to search just for the first letters and, and then have a wild card. So, uh, Nick's going to write some software that will search a, a database of uh, words supplied by Google. Uh, 
where they give you sequences of five, up to five words in a row, and we'll use that data set to do searches. The other possibility is that maybe the poetry book itself was used as some kind of one-time pad where uh, some sentence was encoded by uh, going to a particular word in the poetry book, looking at a, a letter that you're interested in. Find, say if I was interested in the letter A, I would go and find the first word in the poetry book that has the A, and then go to the first letter of that word, and, and that A becomes whatever letter that is. So if H was at the first, I put an H there, and so on. And so Nick will also write software to exhaustively search through the poetry book and see if that one-time pad technique has been used to convert a sentence into first letters as a form of secrecy. Uh, so that's, that's where we're at with the code. And so hopefully Nick will make some breakthroughs um, this year. Another interesting um, breakthrough um, that uh, we did at uni is uh, around 2009, I was just staring at at the Summerton Man's photo that Tony showed you. And I was looking at the ear of the Summerton Man and I was thinking, there's something wrong with this ear. I, I don't know what it is, but it's really strange to me. So I went to an anatomist at Adelaide Uni and I said, can you tell me how to describe this? This, uh, this ear looks unusual to me, but I don't, I don't have the words to describe it. And he says, yes, it's very simple. Simple, he says a normal person's ear has a very a narrow simba, this is hollow here, whereas the Summerton man has a very big simba. And so uh, he says that's very unusual and uh, approximately less than 1% of the population will have that. So that's quite a breakthrough because that's a very key identifying feature. Another interesting thing is, as Tony mentioned, the book was handed in on the 22nd of July, 49. And another thing um, uh, we were able to do at Adelaide Uni was to find uh, a very close copy to this. Um, and that was significant because actually seeing the real copy in the flesh made me realize that what we were seeing here, this slightly lighter border, is what's called a yapped border. What a yapped border means is the book has a loose fly leaf that bends over the edge of the book and that's why it looks a slightly light, lighter color in the photo. And that's significant because now when you look at the code, you can see the yacked border here. So you can see that the code lines up with the book. So it's important to have these correlating facts to match everything up and make sure you've got all the historically correct uh, information. So how I found the, uh, a copy of the book, because the police had lost the original, is I put out uh, a Facebook page and got people all around the world trying to search for this damn book. And, we, and I think it took something like two or three years and we eventually nailed it and found one. The book is identical in all respects to the Summerton Man's book with one slight difference. The Summerton Man's uh, Tamam Shudbit paper was on bleached white paper, but the book I have in my possession is a slightly uh, coloured paper, it's not bleached white. But in all other respects, it's exactly identical. So it's quite useful having that. Another breakthrough was in 2009 when I managed to identify the real identity of Justin, the nurse who had the phone number, of, uh, the summoned man had her phone number. Uh, I was able to find out who she really was because the police had kept that name suppressed. Um, and uh, that was quite significant because what I was able to then do by uh, knowing who she was is I then went and interviewed people who knew her in real life. And I've interviewed everybody who knew her from the 1940s through to, uh, the, to 2007 when she died. So I've got a, a good spectrum of her life. And uh, some of the people that knew her told me that she kept quiet about this whole case, didn't tell them anything about it until 2002. And 2002 is interesting because that also happens to be the year that Jerry Feltz first interviewed her. So obviously Jerry rattled her cage enough 
that she went around to her friends and actually told them that, hey, I'm the nurse in the case. But she, even to her friends, she said that she didn't know anything about the summons of man and she didn't know who he was. But she did tell her friends an interesting story. She told them what happened when the cops came to her door. She said that when the cops knocked on her door, they said, have you seen this book before? She said, yes. They said, uh-huh, so you know this guy? She said, well, uh, actually, I hadn't seen that book that you're holding. I've seen an Omakai before, of course, but not that one. And she, apparently, she told her friends that she had quite a lot of difficulty backpedaling and convincing the police that's what she really meant. So she got off on the wrong foot there. And then they asked her, well, have you ever given a book like this to anyone? And she says, yes, a guy in Sydney called Al Fossil. And we've heard that story already from Tony. But this story is significant because we didn't know before hearing the story that the police had actually really shown her the real poetry book. And from her own story, it appears that they did. So that's a useful bit of information. And um, as Tony said, that she uh, wrote verse 70 in Alf Boxer's copy of the book. So uh, this is the actual short photocopy of that page where she did that in Alf's copy in Sydney. And um, knowing who she was is significant because by, I've got samples of her writing all the way from 1940 something all the way to 2000 and something. And I'm able to verify that that definitely really is her handwriting, um, without a doubt. Um, because one hypothesis before we knew that is could she have bought this book secondhand in a secondhand bookshop and could that have already been written on the book? So we didn't know. So until I was able to verify that, I wasn't able to say that, that she really wrote that, but I can now. And this is quite mysterious that she signed it Jessing because that's not her real name and all the people that I've spoken to that knew her over the years never ever heard her use that name. So it seems to be a special nickname that she invented with Alf Box for Alf Boxall's ears only, as far as I'm aware. This is Alf Box Boxall's book, the front cover, which exists today. Um, I've seen the actual copy, it hasn't been lost. Uh, his family possessed that, and this is the book that has been lost. And as you can see, they are quite different books. This is actually a very thin book, and it's more like a pamphlet. And it would put, fit quite nicely into my jacket pocket, whereas this is a thicker book and would not fit in my pocket. So it's quite likely the Somerton man carried this around in his jacket, because you can see the flyleaf has been eroded here on this corner, and you can just imagine going in and out of his pocket and eroding that corner. Uh, here's a quiz. Can anyone guess who this dead person is? Very Monroe. Oh, very good. <laughs> you weren't supposed to say that so quickly. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but honestly, it, when I first saw that, I wouldn't have known that was Marilyn Monroe. Um, uh, if you've seen it before, I'm sure you know that. So uh, this led... Uh, and yes, that's the correct answer. So, as you can see, if, the, if she was an unidentified person, it would be very difficult to identify her, because you know that's what she really looks like. And that's her autopsy photo. So it struck me that one of the reasons that's been holding back the operation of identifying some to man is all we had is this autopsy photo. So I commissioned an artistic reconstruction of what he might have looked like if he were alive. And I used information from what we know from the inquest report, that fact that he had grey eyes, that he had slight red flecks in his hair. And so we, there's a bit of guesswork in this, but I think it's possibly better than looking at his autopsy photo, because that's like looking at Marilyn's photo. The other thing we've done at the uni is we've been able to obtain uh, samples of the Somerton man's hair, because that exists in the police museum today. Are you going there in the walk? Uh, Not tonight. Ah, oh, damn. Yeah. So you can't see that yourself in the flesh, but in the police museum, uh, they have samples of his hair. And so I was able to, uh, with that mission, obtain some. And uh, so we've looked at his hair carefully under a microscope. 
And what we've done is we've done some isotope tests, which are still ongoing, finding what isotopes in his hair, and that can give us clues as to changes in his lifestyle over the last month of his life. It does appear from our initial results, it seems he was on the move in the last month of his life, because there are sharp changes along the length of his hair as it's growing. The other thing we can do with this hair is extract DNA, and uh, so this is another area where the university is involved. And we have a cutting edge uh, center for ancient DNA. And um, one of the things that we've been able to do at this center is um, extract uh, sufficient DNA from his hair. So we, we, A, we prove that DNA is in fact extractable. So that's good, that's tick number one. Number two, we've extracted sufficient DNA that we've been able to find his maternal haplotype, which is H. Unfortunately, saying that your mother has a DNA type H uh, would apply to 41% uh, 40, of uh, Europeans, so it's <laughs> you can tell he's European just by looking at him, so uh, that doesn't really tell you much. But Handing over to Colleen, who's going to do the next part of the talk, she's now going to explain uh, as we dig into this and get more and more DNA information from the hair, what are some of the cool things we'll be able to do in an attempt to identify him. It does appear the con concentration levels in the hair are quite low, and to do some of the really cool stuff that Colleen can do would in fact require an exhumation where we can get a better source of DNA from the man's teeth. Um, and so more about that later. So that's the end of my talk, but just to finish, I'll just make you aware there is a book about this case written by Jerry Feltis, the policeman that uh, Tony mentioned. Uh, there's also uh, a book by Kerry Greenwood, the fictional writer. Um, uh, this is not about the case, but I like this book because it's about my Brent Whitwad, who is a policeman, very famous policeman in, uh, in Australia, who became commissioner of uh, Queensland, and um, he was involved in stamping out corruption in Queensland, corruption in police force that is, and uh, it so happens that in the 40s, when the Summerton case was going on, he lived here in Adelaide and was an Adelaide policeman. And so he's got a whole chapter on here talking about the police force in the 40s and what it was like. So it gives you a big insight into what the times were like then and how they operated. So it doesn't mention the case, but it gives you a big insight into the police. Uh, just to finish off, uh, we do um, a, a lot of this stuff we have done has also involved crowdsourcing, and we uh, encourage people to help contribute our efforts, and so if you're interested in that, you can go to this Reddit website. Uh, we are also going to be starting a crowdsourcing funding campaign because some of the uh, historical searches that we're doing for old documents and freedom of information applications, extremely expensive, also the DNA and, um, extractions on very low concentration levels can be very expensive as well. And so we're doing a crowdsourcing uh, campaign which will be released very shortly. So keep your eye out on that website. And something you can help straight away if you can is just go straight to this website and help support uh, the petition to exhume the body. Thank you very much.
but that's a speculation. But no, no, no items blame on that. Yeah. Can you explain three times not inside? Did that create discomfort or feeling of unwellness? Um, that's a good question, and um, I will have to follow that up to find out. I had talked to some medical colleagues, and they're a bit vague about that. Some say not necessarily, and some say yes. But so. I need to follow that up, that question. <coughs> yeah? Uh, yes, they're still alive. Yeah. Although she isn't. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much, Derek. And now we welcome Colleen up to explain about what can we do with this DNA. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to talk about DNA identification, one of my favorite subjects. Um, I'm not going to go into the nitty gritties of how you do it. What I thought I'd do is tell you what you can find out by using DNA identification. Uh, let me figure this out. Okay. First of all, let me give you my point of view on DNA. We know about autobiographies. Everybody's read a biography or an autobiography of a well-known person. Maybe some of you have written your own. Well, my opinion my experience is that DNA is kind of a biochemical autobiography. And if there was some way we, can, we could read that autobiography, we could find a lot about you biochemically. Um, DNA, in, it's in a vacuum, just your DNA itself is meaningless. Really, to get any, anything out of that, you have to compare your DNA with other people's DNAs. And as you probably know, the comparison these days can produce information about a disease you may have, uh, your hair color, eye color, what population group you belong to. Like Derek mentioned, that Somerton man belonged to Apple Group H. That is a very large population group in Europe. Well, you know, this doesn't really get us too far down the road with the Somerton man because, you know, initially, maybe if he suffered from some kind of rare disease, that would help. But that is not our first concern. Our first concern really is personal identification. Who is the guy? And in a very easy, simple case, if this was straightforward, that would lead to immediate family members that we could ask about more about who he was, where he came from. There'd be a lot more to that. Let me tell you how this works. There are two kinds of DNA that are used for human identification. One is nuclear DNA, which is the chromosomes we've always know, grown up to know and love that float around in your nucleus. The other is mitochondrial DNA, which are these little floaties that are outside the nucleus of a cell. Forgive my technical terminology there. I'll go to mitochondria first. Mitochondrial DNA are very interesting because it's widely believed that mitochondria used to be independent bacteria millions of years ago that invaded primitive cells. And instead of being digested, those mitochondria, those bacteria, took up residence in the cell and survived and went on to be fruitful and multiply. So the mitochondria got food and water, it gets food and water from the cell, and the mitochondria supplies the cell with energy to stay alive for metabolism and warmth. So it's a symbiotic relationship between the mitochondria and the cell, much like the rhinoceroses with the little birds in their ear. The birds eat the parasites out the rhinoceros's ear, and the rhinoceros gets his ear clean. Same difference, rhinoceros, birds, mitochondria, human cells. There's up to a thousand of these little buggy things called mitochondria in each cell of, the, of your body, and each one of those contains five to 10 copies of a very small genome, little buggy genome, or a mitochondrial genome. And mitochondria is inherited from the maternal line from your mother. Everybody in here has the mitochondria of their mother, everybody. Uh, anybody that has children, those children have the mitochondria of their mother. So guys, if you have children, you have not passed your mitochondria to the next generation. It stops there. So when you're tracing mitochondria, you have to work with the exclusively female line of a family. Mitochondria, as you see, is abundant. You can have up to 10,000 copies of this little genome in one cell of the body. 
So because of the abundance, it's very useful for identifying human remains. This is how it works. You find remains somewhere and you extract mitochondria from them, mitochondrial DNA. And you make a guess. You say, okay, I think my candidate for this person is Mr. Z. The genealogist steps in and works uh, the genealogy along the exclusively female line of Mr. Z's family, starting with his mother, grandmother, up and so, sometimes looking at ants, whatever, always female, and then comes to some kind of ancestor that has maternal descendants, comes back down along the female line, and finds living descendants, can be male or female, because everybody inherits mitochondria from their mother, gets the mitochondria from those descendants, and the question is, does the mitochondrial match? Do the living, mito, mito of the living descendants match miss the candidate's mitochondrial DNA, the mi mitochondrial DNA from the remains? If the answer is yes, you've made the identification. If the answer is no, you've got to get another candidate and start over again. Nuclear DNA, the other kind of DNA, there's 23 pairs of chromosomes in the human cell. Not every being on Earth has 23 pairs of chromosomes. In fact, an onion has an onion has 43 pairs of chromosomes. So if you're mad at your spouse, you can just say, you don't have the chromosomes of an onion. And you'd be right. Okay, nope, heard it in DNA class today. Okay, so uh, this is every, every pair you get one, uh, one of each set, one, one, pair, one of each pair from one of each of your parents. Women have 23 pairs of match sets. In the analogy of a book, it would be as if these are chapters in the DNA book, and one chapter says she has a blue card, and the other one chapter says she has a brown card. That's actually a match set. How the little details of how that's manifested is a little bit different, but it's a match set of statements. All of these are match sets of chromosomes. However, <clears throat> men are different. The last in the, in the last set is a mismatch for a man. A woman gets an X from each of her parents, but a man gets an X from his mother and a Y from his father. So where you have a Y chromosome, you have a man, and where you have a man, you have a Y chromosome. Women don't have that. The Y chromosome is interesting. There's only one copy per cell. Remember, in the mito, you had maybe 10,000 cop, 1,000 mitos, but then you had 10 copies in each one. So up to 10,000, a little fuzzy genome. But for a, for a Y chromosome, you only have one copy, and it's very large. It's not, the mitochondrial genome is more like 16,000 bits long, but a y, the uh, y chromosome is more like 50 million. So, it, and instead of being passed along the mother's line, it's passed along the father's line because that's the male DNA. So when you compare those two, the Y DNA to the mito, you're gonna find out that if you have highly degraded remains, the chances of you getting enough Y DNA, harvesting enough from all these cells to get just those, those right pieces of DNA, you know, and enough of the right pieces, is, you know, depending on the remains, is not the first thing you should think about. So Y DNA is not as useful for identifying, although it, it is, can be used if you're lucky. So the, the process for identifying somebody using Y DNA is very similar, except you start with the candidate and you work the male line of the family up to some convenient ancestor. You work your way back down along the male line until you find a male descendant. And the question is, does the Y DNA of your male descendant meet, match the, the Y DNA of the relative of your candidate match the Y DNA of, that you find in your remains? If it matches, you've done it. If, you, if it doesn't match, you've got to start over with another candidate. It's trial and error. Here's a couple of cases I'm familiar with that I've worked on to give you, get your head around what's involved in this identification process. This was the identification of the unknown child in the Titanic. The death of the baby occurred in 1912. Uh, the baby was exhumed from its, its grave in Halifax in 2001, so that was uh, 78, 79, almost 80 years later, and the ID was done in 2008, so that's uh, quite a bit, 78, about 90 years later. When the grave of the baby was opened, now understand, this is Halifax, this is kind of a you know, cold, wet place. 
The only thing found left of the baby were three small baby teeth and a piece of wrist bone. And it turned out, okay, let's talk about Halifax, the environment up there. The average temperature is about seven degrees C. The average rainfall is very wet, and there's about half of the year it's gonna rain. So you have a very hostile environment. You know, DNA is a big molecule, and when exposed to the wrong environment, it's gonna degrade. The degradation of the DNA, the reason the baby wasn't there, and the reason you know there was kind of a risk of finding DNA was, first of all, the age. You know, 80 years, 90 years had gone by, DNA would degrade with all the dampness and the heat and the cold. But also, Halifax is subject to acid rain. And that acidic environment would be enough to maybe erode, you know, the bones and the teeth and the DNA. However, a, the, a breakthrough happened because the lab that, you know, as the DNA was degraded, there wasn't that much in it, the Armed Forces Lab actually went out and invented or researched new markers in the scraps that they had left and were able to find a marker that was able to identify the baby. This was very lucky because it long story, very interesting story, but there was not much DNA found in the remains and there were several rounds of testing that had to be done as they kept trying things and it wasn't working. And finally the baby was identified, I was told, uh, using the amount, one picogram of DNA, which is the amount in one cell of that baby's body. And after that was consumed, that was it. And uh, it turned out that luckily, even though three baby teeth, only one of those teeth yielded DNA, and even though, you know, there was multiple rounds of testing needed because of the degradation and a few other issues that came up, mitochondrial DNA came through and the identification was made. The baby was Sidney Leslie Goodwin. He was traveling with his whole family to, uh, to America. The father had a promise of a new job. Actually, it's an interesting story because they were not originally booked on the Titanic. They were booked on a steamer going out of Southampton to uh, New York, but they were changed because there was a cold strike and a lot of the, the ship's passengers and some of the affected ships were transferred to the Titanic, including the Goodwin family. Here's another one I was involved in, the crash of Northwest Flight 4422. A military charter jet, it crashed in 1949. It crashed in the backcountry of Alaska, very hostile, remote area. It's only open to access two weeks out the whole year, the weather's so bad. It was discovered in 1999, and identification was made in about 2007. The issues there were the environment, 40, to 40 inches of rain a year, that's not too bad, and uh, it was very cold, it's very cold. This uh, hand was found actually frozen in the glacier for 50 years. So it's kind of like, it's, that's good, it's preserved. But the problem was, after the hand was found and the medical examiner in, in uh, Alaska got hold of it, uh, they tried DNA identification, it was very primitive in the 90s, they tried fingerprint identification, again, very primitive, and there were, nothing was, could be done in the late 1990s with this. So the medical examiner embalmed the hand and put it on the shelf. And that, that really uh, presented a challenge because embalming destroys DNA. It, it makes it like duct tape, you know, it makes it wad up, it's called cross-linking. And when you try to undo it, you know, it shreds. So you wind up with little teeny pieces of DNA you can't work with. So the breakthrough there was that, knowing this, that uh, there was a new uh, way that the AFDEL um, Armed Forces Lab invented to actually dissolve whatever bone was left and allow whatever DNA was existing in the little cracks that the embalming fluid couldn't get to, then that DNA could be released into solution and the, the bone shards were taken away, the formaldehyde from the embalming fluid was taken away and what you were left was the extract from the DNA and the yield went up 25, I think, to 50%. They got more DNA and they were able to do the identification. The lab wanted to do this because this is vintage 1948. It was embalmed. The lab at that time still has a project to identify 869 unidentified uh, MIAs uh, from the Korean War, American MIAs, in the Punchbowl Cemetery in Hawaii and they had all been very heavily embalmed in the 1950s. So the lab felt that if they could do the hand in the snow, because it had been embalmed, it was about the same vintage, that they could use any techniques that they discovered 
forward. They could use them forward to help identify these soldiers, and that's correct. That's what they're doing right now. In this case, we got both Mido and we got Y, so we were able to trace. We had our candidate. In fact, there were 30 people on, the, on board the plane, and the guy, it turned out, was number 30. We had ruled out 29 of those, and we were right on the edge of our chair because if we couldn't do it, it meant there was a mistake made sometime in the 10 years, and how are you ever going to figure out Maybe somebody sent their neighbor's DNA in, you know, something like that. But we did it. It was a real cliffhanger. It's the last guy. We got not only Mito, we got Y-DNA. We were able to confirm the identification of both sides of the family. And in addition, they turned out to be Frank Van Zandt, an American born in Vermont in 1911, died in 1948. And it's a hand, right? So it also became the oldest fingerprint uh, identification on record, 61 years. There was also a lot of innovations in fingerprint identification, how to revive this very desiccated old hand with almost no, nothing, no features on the fingertips left. The team did it. So this was a grand slam, both kinds of DNA and the fingerprint. You couldn't miss it. It was Frank Van Dam. All right, the Summerton man. How does he stack up against these? Well, let's see, death in 1948, you know, it's the same year that plane crashed. He was not on the plane, okay? Let's rule out the other 29 people. Uh, location was Adelaide. Now, the environment, I, did, I know I can't get the same period of time and the same statistics for the weather, but let me just give you, you know, the average is, I looked it up in uh, the last few years, well, the last 25, 30 years, the average rainfall here is 11 inches of rain. And the average temperature is about 21 degrees C. So it's nice and warm and dry, which is a good thing for DNA. Uh, and, and there's some degradation. We know that the man had some kind of embalming. You know, Derek is the expert on that. He was, in, you know, his organs were removed, according to what I understand, ahead of time before the embalming fluid was applied. So that meant it had to be, uh, uh, you know, injected certainly regionally, you know, or partly and not just circulated through his body. So there may be parts of the remains that have not been embalmed, which is a good thing. But you see, now we know how to handle embalmed remains, so that's good, right? And so, that highly likely to me that there's DNA left. Because, you know, look, look at, we had the teeth from the baby that was almost 80, 90 years old. We did that. This man was, was buried in a le much less hostile environment here weather environment, and he probably, his teeth are still there. You know, he's probably not subject to much degradation at all. The hand was made based on DNA taken from the long bone of the hand. Again, a very hostile environment. It had been embalmed, but we know how to handle embalming much better these days, and the Summerton man probably has the long bones of his body intact, I would imagine. So I have great confidence that if he's exhumed, that is highly likely there's DNA left, enough DNA, enough good DNA that can be used to help identify them. Okay, there's some good news and there's some bad news. The bad news is this, we don't have a candidate. <laughs> there's seven billion people in the world, which one of you wants to go first? <laughs> the second thing, so we can't have a family reference, we can't get a, no matter how we look, we can't line people up and start checking them off the list. That list is seven billion people long. If you want to confine your attention to just Europe, hmm, let's reduce it to about what? Uh, seven billion, five hundred million. Yeah, we got it right down there, didn't we? Uh, mitochondrial and Y DNA, you know, you can't do what I just described because you don't have the family reference. What do we do now? Well, there are a few things that that we can we're places we can go with this. We're going to use genetic genealogy. How about that? I showed you this where, you know, I described how you could do DNA, a forensic identification, find the family members, la, 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 what I just said. Well, we don't have any family members. So why don't we do this? Instead of using the DNA of the Summerton man against the DNA of a supposed family member, what I propose is this. Take the Summerton man try and find people that kind of match him, but reach through those people and find things about their geography, could be his geography, their family pedigree, he's got to fit into their family pedigree if he's kind of related, 
and also their chronology. So let's not look at hair color, eye color, is he the brother, sister of somebody, not just hardcore DNA. Let's reach through that and find a group of people he's related to and, and because their social characteristics, their family history, their geography has to be his in a larger sense. Just like Derek said, he has to be European. That's the first step. If he's European, you have some kind of differentiation between if somebody's Native American or from uh, you know, Africa or China. So genetic genealogy would work like this. If we can get Y DNA uh, from this, the remains of the Somerton man, instead of trying to match it against who we believe is the son or uncle or cousin, why don't we do this? Why don't we realize that Y DNA is handed down along the direct male line of the family? And that's the way the family name is handed down. This has become a really hot item in genealogy these days. And there have been quite a few genealogists that have taken uh, DNA tests to study their last name. And in America, this is all the rage. I know a lot of people in Australia have done this. There are several companies that will test your Y DNA just for genealogical purposes. I have a Y-DNA study going of the Fitzpatricks. I have about 300 Fitzpatricks from all over the world. My cousin here, Ron, is sitting in the front row. He is Ron Fitzpatrick. DNA-wise, I don't think we're related, so, even though we're kindred spirits. So that doesn't, that doesn't, DNA doesn't go tell you that. So uh, if, you, if we could get the Somerton's man's Y-DNA out of him, why not throw it and do what the genealogists do? Just find his genealogy. You know, this is a hot item for male adoptees that don't know their, their last name. They'll get their Y DNA done, their Y DNA is thrown into the big database with the rest of the genealogists, and maybe a last name comes out which gives them a good lead. The statistics on this, there's about 400,000 people out there. There's about uh, 80 to 10,000 big and small databases where you can check to see if you match. A uh, public database, the biggest one is 104,000. The Scottish database alone has almost 7,000 people. Surname Project, uh, the biggest one, not surprisingly, is Smith. That's about 2,000 people. So that's a lot of people. And keep in mind that if you see the name Fitzpatrick in a database, that's not just one guy. That's all the Fitzpatricks in its extended family. So if you want to really give an estimate of how many people out there that represents, say you have 104 in Y search, that really, how many males per family, 50 or whatever? That could be several million people. And if you've had 400,000 people tested, that could be, you multiply that by maybe 50 people, uh, a, um, you know, a, a family, that could be maybe 20 million people represented by those 400,000. So if you take Y DNA from the man, you put it in these genealogical databases, you might be able to get his last name. Wouldn't that be cool? The other thing you can do is this. Oh, by the way, this has been used, I've used this successfully in uh, cold cases in the United States. And if I can't get a last name, sometimes I can get an ethnicity because some of those genealogists have a big Polish DNA study or a big Italian. So just the fact the name Fitzpatrick Smith is not the end of it. I can look in ethnic, uh, ethnic studies, if, even if there's a, not a study for a Castro Giovanni or a Zbigniew Brzezinski study. Those guys are lurking there in the Polish and the Italian studies, so I can maybe be able to find matches or I can find at least the ethnic background of the guy in terms of nationality. Uh, the other, okay, there's lots of DNA I didn't say anything about. Autosomal DNA is the rest. It's the two X's on the female and all the other uh, pairs of chromosomes I didn't say anything about. You inherit one from each parent. So what, how they do this is this is a picture of 20, it looks get to the 23 chromosome pairs. One, two, three, you can count them. One, two, three, four, five, all the way down to the X. And as, let's say this is a woman that has her, her autosomal DNA tested. What they do is the companies, the genealogy companies, test 700,000 points on your DNA. And they throw your points into the big database and they find out how many points you share with everyone else that have been tested and the percent shared indicates your relationship with that person. So for example, okay, the less, the more you share, the closer you're related, the less you share, the more distantly you're related. So if I happen to pop my DNA in there and I come up with somebody who shares 
of their points with me, they have to be my sibling or my parent or my parent. If uh, I find somebody that shares 12 and a half percent, they're my first cousin. Three uh, percent, my second cousin, and less than a percent, they'd have to be in the range of my third cousin. The closer you get, the more accurate the estimate. As you get further away, the statistics kind of get a little bit fuzzier, but this, and it's a little more complicated than this, but this is how it works. You get your points tested, figure out what percent you share with somebody else, that gives you your relationship, an estimate of your relationship with that other person. Then you sit down with the other person and you say, gee, we're second cousins. Who were your great grandparents? Where did they live? What is their family history? What is their ethnic background? I want to compare them to my great grandparents to see if we might be related, if they might all be from the same town or something like that. Well, hypothetically, if we did this with the Summerton man, this is what we would come up with. This is a company that does this kind of testing. It's run by Mrs. Google, by the way. And this is uh, called 23andMe. And if we threw the Summerton man uh, DNA into the hopper, he would come up. Here's him on the top, Summerton man. And here's, say, like four people that come up to be matches. OK, there he is. And here's the four names of the people. And here they give an estimate of their cousinship. It turned out in this hypothetical case, they'd all be his the second to fourth, second to fourth. These are not particularly close, but just take it. This is just a hypothetical example. You see the second to fourth shares less than a percent. So in the range of third, I told you a third cousin shares less than a percent. There you go, 0.92, 0.88 percent, so on. So these people are roughly third cousins. Well, immediately we find a problem because no one knows who he is. We have no, nothing to discuss on that end. And there are many people that know a lot of their family, but not all of it. You know, they, I, can't, I can tell you a certain distance back on my own, but then I lose it. So it kind of the further back you get, the more possible connections you have. So we've got a problem. This is how you get around the problem. You say, you, look, you ask the first guy in the list, Stan, you say, where, where are your parents from? Let's, let's not go the same thing like, uh, you know, I know you, we're related, we're cousins. Let's step beyond that and go into the geography history part of the family, the, the kind of more social type stuff, or uh, what's it called, uh, ethnic type stuff. Okay, asking Stan, his, his mother and father, this is taken from another case. I just put the Summerton man on there to give you an example. Uh, this man's parents, one was from Romania and one was from the Ukraine. Fine, throw that on the map. There's a red balloon. Okay, let's say Thomas, his, his father was from, in this case, I'm, I, I spoke to him, his father's from Romania, his mother's from Egypt. She belongs on a different map for now. Okay, Jane, her, her uh, parents are from uh, southern Poland and Belarus. That's a green pin. Let's do one more. Frida, let's say that her parents, I interview her, and she tells me her, one of her parents is from Romania and one's from the Ukraine. Now, the Summerton man is not going to be related to both of those, right? We don't know which one. But as I build this up, I'm looking for little bubbles of people that come from the same place because people that share geography, DNA share geography. Now, I did this in a case which I'm using just as my Summerton man case here. And after I had interviewed, you know, say six, seven of the top matches, and I asked him the same question, I came up with this. And you can see there's two bubbles there. One's in southern Poland, and one would be in Romania. So I could say one of, the, one of his parents are from that geographical area, and the other parent would be from the other. But I don't know which one's which. I'd have to do more thinking and more analysis. But you see what I'm doing. I'm not really caring how, if your great-grandmother's my great-grandmother, I'm past that. People can't tell me that because at Summerton, we don't know. But what I'm doing is I'm reaching behind that into the geography, the history, and stuff like that. Furthermore, suppose that two of the people that come up on the people in Poland, in this case, suppose they know how they're related. They're related from John Smith, who, who was born in 1811. Those people might know how they're related. I can check the Summerton man. DNA to see if he shares the DNA with those two people as they share with each other, which means they have a common ancestor, which would start to give me a pedigree, a family tree for the Summerton man. So you see I'm starting to draw, draw uh, other clues, not from himself, but all the people he matches out there that 
that I can say through DNA there's some degree of cousins, and I'm getting my information from a secondary source. In conclusions, number one, DNA can probably be extracted from the Somerton man's remains if they allow his exhumation. Secondly, um, regular identification procedures will probably not work unless somebody comes forward as a family reference, like a close family member, you know, a son, a daughter, or something like that, a brother, uh, a nephew, very close. But we don't know that. And genetic genealogy, though, holds promise because using Y-DNA and autosomal DNA, we can get clues that we can work forward genealogically to try and find out who he is. Thank you. I have Okay, thank you, Colleen. That's a crash course in, in DNA. Fantastic. Okay, now, some questions for Colleen. Yeah. Yeah, um, I've got my first time to European psychological profiling. Yeah, I agree, absolutely. And I think uh, Dr. Abbott's kind of onto some of that, which is very good because in some of the cold cases I worked on, they profiled, in one, they profile a guy to the nth degree, but I gave them the last name and it was like pop. They had 3,000 people on their list, so they couldn't, you know, go through all of them and say, well, which one, you know, because it's kind of really psychological. It's not but, you know, that, along with the name, yeah. Yeah. talk to Dr. Abbott more because it turns out the radioactive isotopes in someone's body uh, can tell you where they were born to some extent. The oxygen, the radioactive oxygen uh, is different all over the world depending on the rainfall and the water, groundwater supply and uh, there's a naturally occurring amount of radioactivity around us all the time. So that being said, it's not uniform, it's all different. So there's been a lot of work done on matching the radioisotopes in someone's teeth to the place where they were born. Because once that's locked into the matrix of the enamel of your teeth, it doesn't change. Another thing which is very interesting is that for, uh, in the 1950s, they detonated a lot of uh, uh, you know, nuclear atmosphere into the test ban treaty in the 60s. So there's been a lot of work done with people with either their baby teeth or their secondary teeth being formed during those periods of time, uh, 40s and 50s. He may have been a little bit beyond that. Uh, th again, that's another source of carbon, uh, radioactive carbon that's locked into teeth. And it turns out that because, you know, they detonated the bombs and the radioactivity went was sky high, but then the test ban treaty allowed it to relax. If you can figure out how much radioactivity sometimes they can get to within a month of when that person's born by because it's falling off and you catch it because that's what's locked into your teeth. Now he might be a little older than that, but uh, any kind of you know dental formations, even if you're already done with your baby teeth, but you're getting secondary teeth in, that also applies because it's teeth being formed. You know, 
So there's a lot of work done on, on the, also the uh, radioisotopes in food and you know, the plants and animals. So um, that's something that we still have to discuss, but a very good potential possi possible way to at least pin them down geographically. questions for any of the panel? Yeah.
Curiously, you know those three pictures we had of a man a day after embalming, ten days and six months? By the time the six months photo was taken, the, there had been weakage from the autopsy and embalming um, incisions, and so both the shirt and the tie that he was wearing in the six month photo were not his at all, they were my Uncle Laurie's. Because they'd yeah, that didn't stay. Okay, look, I'm conscious that we've got another part of the afternoon to do yet. Um, I'd like to give our speakers one last chance to say something, if you'd like to. Anybody no, I'm speakers? good. I'm good. Okay. I hope he gets exhumed. I hope, because remember, it's not just the story, it's not just him. He had a mother, he had a father, maybe brothers, sisters, family out there that could be looking for him. So there's also some kind of concern for the living family members to bring them closure about what happened to him, not just to find out who he is. Thanks for that. Um, uh, no, I was going to. Okay. All right, well, thank you again. Please thank our panelists.